and they had made the erasers and lowered themselves. And by the way, the actual grades between the two classes, the Tuesday, Thursday class, came out a letter grade lower on the average, which means by erasing, they reduced themselves one letter grade. Now, let's do another experiment. This one was done as a doctoral dissertation on 25 executives. They took all the facts for a problem, fed it into a computer. And then they gave the same facts to 25 executives and asked them to make a decision. All of the executives made the same decision. Independently, but the same decision. And the computer made a different decision. Well, they put the decision into effect and they found out that the executives were right and the computer was wrong. So they interviewed the executives and they said, with these facts, don't you think the computer made the right decision? Every one of the executives says, oh yes, that's exactly what the computer should have done. Then they asked this question, well, why did you make a wrong decision when you knew the facts? Now, they had different words. They didn't all have the same word, but some of the words were hunch. And some of them were intuition. And some of them were, I got a whim. Or some of them, I just knew that that was the way it should be done. Now, where are they getting all these whims and hunches and intuition? Isn't this a poor way to run a company? They were asked this question, is this the way you've been making decisions all your life? All the executives said yes. By the way, they hadn't told very many people this is the way they did it. But they had found out in their younger years that the decisions I make on how I feel are the right ones. Now, where are those decisions coming from? The subconscious. And why can't that computer come up with the right one? No subconscious. Now, what you suppose is in the subconscious of an executive? A memory drum that has experiences from childhood, and can we ever get that much into a computer? Now, if we could take the whole memory drum of an executive's head, I don't know how you'd ever do this, but if you could get the whole thing in a computer, would the computer be as good as the executive? But because the computer does not have the information, the computer has to come out on the losing end. Now, does that begin to show you that point B is a valid point at which to make a decision? Now, how will you feel at point B? Just like these executives. You'll just have a feeling that this is the way it should be. Now, will you have any scientific basis for your decision? Will you be able to prove it on paper to somebody that this is the way to go? But it will be the right way. Now, what do you suppose we're looking at at point B? One magic word, principle. I have a beautiful way to illustrate this for you. Let's assume that every one of us tonight in our creative imagination would stand up, walk over here to the window, and I've already taken all the glass out. I want you to look down and see all the little cars and all the little people. Everybody's standing right by the window now looking down. The next thing I want you to do is jump. I've done this for years and years. And every group I have are so submissive. They actually go over the window, and even people who are afraid of high places will look out, and palms of their hands will get moist. But I can't get anybody to jump. When it comes to the jumping, they rebel. They make a quick and accurate decision so fast that even their inward desire to be submissive is too late. The decision is made just like lightning. Now, how do they make such a quick decision and why is it accurate? All right now, it's based on the principle or the law of gravity. Now, do they know the law of gravity? They know exactly what's going to happen. Can they predict? I want to show you something interesting. In our society, we do not like responsibility. And a lot of people will not take promotions because there's added responsibility. And we have been trained that responsibility is not good. All right now, is there anyone here who does not love and wish to have the responsibility of the decision you just made? In other words, do you have a good feeling in your heart right now for the responsibility? Now, you're doing something contrary to a social norm. You're doing what? You're liking responsibility. Now, why do you suppose you like responsibility? Easy. Can you predict the outcome? 
the minute I can predict the outcome at point B, will I love the responsibility that goes with it? All right, now let's reverse it. If people do not like responsibility, that means they are making decisions without principles, which means can they predict? I wouldn't like responsibility either if I had to make a decision I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, that's why you make a decision and run. Take a vacation and come back afterwards to find out how it all worked out. But what if you can predict? Now, if I'm dealing with a law, can I predict? Then the secret of decision-making at point B is in principle. So what should you do tonight? I'm thinking of one gentleman who took the seminar. And after studying this whole particular procedure, he decided that he should know principles. And he has taken the book of Proverbs of 31 chapters, and he reads one chapter a day, and when the month is over, he starts over again. He does that all the way around a year. Is he filling his mind, his subconscious, full of principles? Now, the more principles you can build into your life, will it be easy to make decisions at point B? Because all you do is from A to B, gather all the information, then at point B, in your computer, you plug in the information, and the right principle comes to the front, and what do you do if you have all the information and the principle? What did you do over here at the window a while ago? You had the information, didn't you? You had the principle. You walk back and sit down. And you're alive. Now, what for an instant, if I told you there was a new law, that you could jump out of the window and float for two hours tonight, and then land gently on your front lawn. Some of you might still be over here at the window, you know, wondering what you should do, because would you have two principles then? You get all mixed up when you have two principles. Every once in a while in my life, I come to point B and I've had two principles. Now, I think this is a wonderful situation, because if I come to point B and I have two principles, I do a real wonderful thing. It just takes five minutes. I go somewhere alone and I tell myself, if I have two principles, I need a change in my value system. Because values are what determine whether I'm going to go to C or D. I'll give you an illustration. I was in a seminar in Eugene. It was one o'clock in the morning. And I was about ready to come back to Portland. Some people came in and they said, there's an alcoholic over at Junction City and he has all the money in the world and he would like for someone to come over and counsel him tonight. I had gathered the information. I had reached point B. And the first principle to come to my mind was help everybody whenever they need it. Thought, That's good. I should go. And the next principle come right after it. Get all the money you can wherever you can get it. <laughs> That's a good principle. And I was about ready to make my decision on the basis of the principles, and I was going to go to Junction City. And another principle came into my mind. Health is wealth. And I thought for a minute, and I said, that's a contradictory principle. My next thought was, where did it come from? And I remembered at home, someone had given us one of these calendars made out of cloth material. It was in the kitchen hanging at the bottom of it. It said, health is wealth. Do models work in homes? Every time you look at them, even though you're not reading them, you're going right into that subconscious. So here was one I hadn't read at all, but it had gone into the subconscious, and at point B, sure enough, did the subconscious bring it up. What about this? Health is wealth. So I told the people, I said, would you give me five minutes alone? You say, will people wonder? And I say, who cares? Am I trying to please them or my head? My head. So I take five minutes and I realize that I have actually spent all night counseling till the sun comes up. Then I think of Dr. Gurney here in Portland who died in his 40s because he overworked. In other words, he would help you any time, day or night. Then I realized if I lived to be 80, could I do more than if I died at 40? Would I have more knowledge and more experience in the last 40 years than the first 40 years? And would I be of more value? All right, now, if I lived another 40 years, would I make more money? 
Sure, look at all the money you could make an extra 40 years on the year. So it was real simple. I came back and I said no. If they would like an appointment, have them call my secretary in Portland and come to my office tomorrow. And I got in the car and I drove back to Portland. By the way, I had an appointment the next morning at 8 o'clock. And I kept a young girl, I think, from committing suicide. Now, had I stayed up all night, would I have been any good to counsel her the next day? Then, in other words, I say I have set up a priority of principle, and I have made a decision. By the way, he didn't commit suicide that night either, in case some of you are wondering what happened to him. He's still drinking. But the point is, if you operate this way, then you can solve the problem. Now, there could be another principle. What if it was my own son going to kill himself that night? Or I'd stay up. I'd call the secretary and cancel all appointments that morning. Do I have another principle coming in in a hierarchy? Now, if you get these all clear and have a clear-cut value system, will you ever have to tell anybody you're confused? Now, the best way I know to keep your value system clean and clear-cut is make your decisions at point B, and the minute you have two principles in conflict and you straighten out your value system, will always be a clean value system. Then we always do exactly what you wanted to do instead of looking back and saying, I wish I hadn't done that. In other words, examine what you're going to do ahead of time before you do it instead of always going around saying hindsight's better than foresight. After going through the four ways to make decisions, number one, the 95% by habit of something good or bad. The second is the 5% by evaluation of good and bad. The third is that point B between two alternatives that are both good. And the fourth is at I, J, K, and L. Now, I do not recommend that you make decisions on any one of those four methods. They all have their disadvantages. What I'd like to go into tonight is the additional three Ds of how I would make decisions. All right, let's take the first one. I'm at point zero. I have been neutral. I do not know the object exists at all. As time carries me into the beginning, curiosity hits me before I even know what I'm doing. And curiosity tells me that there is a girl walking up the street. Now, I operate totally on a philosophy that everything on earth is good. This is the philosophy that I have accepted. Will Rogers is neutral towards you if he hadn't seen you. The minute he looks at you, he's curious. After he finds out only enough to find out what? You're a human. Then he immediately makes a decision to the very top of the positive aura that you're wonderful. Now we say that he is making 95% of his decisions based on philosophy. What's his philosophy? I never met a man I didn't like. Now, what would I recommend on the diagram of which way would I go? I would go the way Will Rogers goes. I would make my decision to save my energy supply. I would not go through the evaluation process. And I would like everybody. Isn't that easy? And I do it not on the basis of any type of bias or prejudice, but on the basis of a predetermined philosophy. In other words, I made up my mind that everybody I meet, I'm going to like. Now, if I've already made up my mind I'm going to like you, have I made a decision once and for all, forever? Does that save millions of decisions the rest of my life? Does that save a lot of time and energy? Now you say, is that safe? What have we talked about already this evening? Can we assure you it would be all right? All you're going to lose is your pride. Isn't that all Eve traded her life for? In her bargain, wasn't this all she received? She got her pride for which she gave her life. What we're trying to do tonight is not to give our life, right? Which do you really want? Your life or your pride? Are you sure? Are you really sure? Because if you really would rather have your life than your pride, could you do what Will Rogers does? Will you be taken? 
See, we're quite mixed up here. Some say yes, some say no. Would you like to know the real truth? The majority of the situations you cannot be taken. But in the fringe areas you will be taken. I wouldn't want to disillusion you in any way. I would like for you to know you're going to be taken. Let's illustrate it this way. We have a segment of the population which we're going to call 100%. We have some at the very bottom and some at the very top, and we have a large percentage in the middle. Now, the percentage at the very bottom are crooks, and they're going to stay crooks. And all the believing that you want to do to them is not going to change them much. And this particular group will take you. The upper group are going to be honest, even if you think they're going to cheat you, they won't. Their own integrity will cause them to overcome the law that you're invoking to make them cheat. Now we have a large middle group here. Now this middle group is a fascinating group to me because they can go either way. They will either go to the criminal corner or to the side of integrity depending on what the reaction you have toward them. If you believe that they are bad, they are bad, and if you believe they are good, they are good. Now, if you want to be profitable in business, are you going to be catering to the B and C group or to the A group? If you cater to the A group, we'll go bankrupt. I'll give you an illustration. A department store here in town, in their shoe department, has a philosophy, and they put it into a policy. Any merchandise that's returned, they accept it with a smile and take all the blame. A lady walks in who was a nurse. She had these white nurse's shoes. And she had polished them and polished them and polished them, and the polish was so thick on them that it cracked. And she thought the leather had cracked. So you walk to the salesman and says, the shoes that you sold me are no good. His first reaction was to become very angry. He wanted to take out his pocket knife and scrape the wax off and make a fool out of her. And show her that the leather was perfect, that nothing could crack but the wax. But since he knew the store policy, he smiled graciously and says, I'm very sorry that we sold you a pair of inferior shoes. We'll be glad to replace them. And he was talking to her a little longer, and she said, Well, I have had them for six months. I don't think it's quite right for you to replace the whole shoe. Why don't we do it 50-50, 50 percent of what I pay? In other words, I'll pay half on the new ones. He said, Whatever you like, we want to do everything right. Before the sale was over, she had paid three-fourths on the new shoes. And she thanked him, and she went out telling everybody that this is a wonderful store. Now, what if he had have scraped with his pocket knife the wax, showed her the shoe was in good shape, and told her to keep it? Could she have believed him? No, she would have believed him. He had a very sharp pocket knife, and he took off part of the top leather that was cracked down to the cracked part, and she went out and told everybody, that, and by the way, that she would exaggerate it. And eventually, if that store being business, by the way, they're doing very well today. I heard of one department store in Columbus, Ohio, that had more electric razors returned in the months of January and February than they sold from September to December combined. Oh, this is a tremendous way for me to find out whether you're positive or negative tonight. If that was wonderful, you're positive. If that's bad, you're negative. The store considered it wonderful. Some of you look at me like you can't understand. I'll explain it to you. By the way, don't look at me too much because you're telling me where you're at. <laughs> <laughs> if you received a razor for Christmas and you did not know where it came from and you thought of a store to take it back to, what would you think of that store? Would this be the store which you would have the most positive aura for? Now, why do you think the store was rejoicing? They knew that they were in the market to stay. They knew that the people 
thought of them more highly than any other store. Isn't this interesting? I heard of a mail order firm in Chicago ran a study for two years to find out how many people would actually cheat. Why don't you in your mind right now just take a figure of what percentage you think over the two-year period. By the way, we're talking about five million customers to show you we've got a good cross-sample of American society. Five million customers in a two-year period. Just take a guess of what percentage of them you think tried to take advantage of the store. I'll give you the figures. It's one half of one percent. And therefore, if I have made a philosophy, have I made a decision once and for all? Now, I have already made this decision in my life, and it's good for as long as I'm going to be on the earth. Now, is this economical? One decision from now forever will handle all actual decisions that will ever occur in relationship to whether it's good or bad. So what do I do? I see anything. In other words, anything my five senses bring to my eyes, what do I say immediately? Wonderful. And I push that just as high as I can get it to the positive aura. Then immediately I throw a block, and my blocks are very final, they're forever. Do I ever have any intentions of breaking them down? What if information keeps bombarding me? You're a crook. You stole this. These people said this. This has also been reported. What's my block do? I got a blind, a belief, and a block that everything is wonderful and everything is good, and I remain at the top of the positive aura, and nothing can change me. Isn't that easy? It's non-rational. And it's the opposite of being rational. Am I open-minded? No. I'm not a rational being. Am I using any of the advantages that Eve gave her life for? As far as I'm concerned, Eve died in vain. Because everything she died for, what have I done with one actual decision? I don't want to know. After you have made this once and for all decision, to end all decisions, and you're going to definitely decide everything is good, let me show you one problem that's going to come up. You have past habits. And chances are, some of these past habits are negative decisions. For approximately one year, you're going to have to willfully encounter the 95% that is normally handled by habit and say, wait a minute, I believe things are good. And you're going to have to take this 95% by habit that's going negative and deliberately make it go positive. Let me give you an illustration. After I decided everything was good, I was going to live in a positive or entirely, I was walking along in a grocery store. And I noticed that I moved almost six inches away from some asparagus. Now this was strictly by habit without conscious thought. The minute I become conscious of it, I moved real close to the asparagus and touched it. Now, when I was a little boy, I had to sit in front of a plate of asparagus for three hours. And I had made up my mind that I would never touch the stuff again on the face of the earth. That day, I purchased asparagus. Let me tell you something. Truthfully, tonight, I love asparagus. But I actually had to willfully choose to love it. I would even challenge you this evening, take something like foods and learn to love everything. So I have made my decision that everything is good and I've gone to the top of the positive aura. Now I know this shakes a lot of people up. And a lot of people say, what about all the reality of the negative syndrome? 
And I say, what reality? And I ignore it totally, because I believe that everything is wonderful and everything is good. Everything that happens in the physical environment around you is the result of mental thinking. You mentally bring it into being, even if it takes 20 years. So whatever your environment is tonight, realize that you created it by mental thoughts. I, I know one particular man, he's walking along in an alley, and the guy come up, put a gun in his rib, says, I'm going to take all your money, and he had a Bible, the pages, it was a silver color on the outside. And he turned around, and he's smiling, no fear whatsoever, and he didn't intend to do anything bad, and he had the Bible just in his hand like that nonchalantly, and he was saying, this is my weapon. And he was getting ready to talk to him about Scripture, and the guy saw that silver thing in the moonlight. <laughs> says, don't shoot, don't shoot. Dropped his guns and jumped back about ten feet and said, I'll do anything you want. <laughs> so this particular minister actually converted him right on the spot because the guy, he was a center shaking. If you knew how powerful a person is who's up here, then all these thoughts of these horrible things that are manufactured down here wouldn't exist. If you really knew... I'll give you a, a simple story and I can tell whether you're in a positive or a negative syndrome. Will Rogers came into New York on the rodeo thing. He was roping from his horse. Guy come up and he says, I am broke. I need some money. Will Rogers loaned him some money. Wouldn't you loan money to a guy who, if everybody in the world is good? All right, now in the process of the tour, about a year later, he came back through New York and he was getting ready for another vaudeville appearance and the guy walked up to him and he says, I'm broke again. We hadn't paid back the first loan yet. Bill Rogers says, oh, you need more money? Here it is. So he went around the circuit again. He came back to New York. And this time, his wife and him had planned to go back to Oklahoma to the ranch for a vacation. And they'd been saving all of this money. So he came back to the hotel that night. And that was supposed to be the last performance. And they were supposed to get on the train, go back to Oklahoma. And he says, honey, we're not going. She says, well, you promised me. He says, I know, but I don't have any money now. She says, what happened to the money? He said, well, you know that guy. He come up and he wanted another loan. And I give it all to him because he needed a big loan this time to really pull the business out. Now, this is a story of a man who never met a man he didn't like. Now, if you think the time he asked for the second amount of money and hadn't paid back the first, that he was a crook, what would you do on the second loan? You wouldn't give it to him. Now, what would you do if he wanted all your money on the third loan? But now, if he's a wonderful person, what's he going to do with the money? Obviously, he's going to pull the thing together, and he needs that much more money so he can pay you back all three loans. It's all how you look at it. Let me give you an illustration to show you what I mean. My wife was driving home to our ranch alone, and she had a flat tire. She stopped at a service station to have it repaired, and he repaired it, and she drove on home. When she was telling me about it, she handed me the bill. I looked at it, and it was six and a half dollars. The first thought that came to my mind was the indoctrination that I've had in this society. What would a service station man do with a woman alone? Take advantage of her. Did I have evidence? I had a bill for six and a half dollars for the actual repair of one flat tire. 